you, Dr. Haynes. Uh, uh, just to share with you, this is a course uh, I developed uh, with the help of uh, quite a number of graduate students who are all uh, listed uh, under the umbrella of infusing international concepts into our extension curriculum. And some of you are aware that Penn State has a huge uh, international agriculture development dual title degree graduate program. One of the things is that how we can infuse uh, international concepts into that program through engagement. So what we did collectively is to see how we can go about it. And I use the strategy is getting two shots, uh, two birds in one shot. One to make it a learner-centered approach, a student-driven approach. Or second, to get as much information as possible on agriculture extension services around the globe. So uh, with that, uh, we uh, just uh, started off looking at uh, this. We are going to organize our presentation across these uh, seven or eight uh, categories. First, background, as I said, I developed the course uh, to make sure that we provide the opportunity to all graduate students about agriculture extension services. And, uh, and, uh, so, as some of you may be aware, the first agriculture extension service was established way back in the 1870s in Denmark. Since then, so many countries have developed extension services, especially after they were liberated from colonial rules, especially British and French. And so, again, the latest change to extension services is in the last 20, 25 years is Eastern European countries where Penn State has hosted and several of your universities have hosted a faculty from those countries to the United States to infuse the whole concept of a non formal education. And one of the things is that as we encourage our students to get involved in international agricultural extension, it is very critical that we are aware of, get familiar with, understand how the extension is structured, organized, how the programs are delivered, uh, implemented, and evaluated, and so on and so forth. So with that in mind, we just continue uh, to, uh, is, as you can see, is that a good in-depth analysis of each country profile would really help us understand the whole concept, especially as it looks into social, economic, political aspects of how it shaped agriculture extension services and how the programs are developed, how the programs are offered, is it top driven, bottom up, and so on and so forth. Especially if you look at from the graduate studies point of view, we need to look at the organizational structure and the program design, delivery, and implementation and ultimately evaluation. So these are very critical. At the same time, those who are graduating from master's or PhD degrees and intact dual type degree program, they should be able to comprehend the agriculture extension services and compare and contrast not only with the US system, but also with other countries. And again, as I said, this is the course I developed, and it was uh, all student driven or learner centered driven. I just provided a framework, and so with this objective in mind, uh, to describe agriculture extension services in terms of social, economic, and agriculture provider. That is just to get a feel for the country. And the second objective is totally involved in agriculture extension services. How it is structured, how it is organized, and how the programs are developed, delivered, and implemented. And the last one is provides a critical thinking and also a synthesis of information to compare and contrast agriculture extension services across the world. So as I said, two-fold approach and six students were enrolled in this graduate level class and they were all asked in the first session to select a country on their own. I did not do anything other than asking them to select their country on their own. You will see uh, the diversity of the country selected, which to my surprise, represented almost all continents uh, in the world. And second, we used a learner-centered approach, which is very much student-driven. And I'll share that with you in a minute. And 
and that is developed by Wyoming Twenty Twelve. With these two concepts intertwined, the students engage from the entire semester to understand the various extension services and come up with a presentation and discussion. Uh, these are the five things that I told them to look into: uh, social, economic, uh, political aspects, agriculture extension services, and based on that information, they should be able to identify strengths and weaknesses. And then, using those and the discussions, develop some strategies to see what possibilities are there to help and improve the programs. And finally, compare and contrast with U.S. extension system and other extension systems uh, in other countries so that we have a better understanding. Uh, this is the five characteristic, uh, characteristics of student-driven or learning centers. Uh, teaching, one is engagement. The word engagement in this particular course was total involvement of students from day one till the end of the semester. They were in charge except for the one slide I showed you earlier. Second, skill development. It helps you to really critically think, synthesize information on the concepts and how these things are organized and how it can be uh, compared. And once you start learning those things, it helps you some kind of self-reflection. What did I learn? How did I learn? And how I can improve the whole concept of learning. That's what Weimar says that this is a very self-reflection is very, very important. Then, once you do these three things, the chances of motivation is very, very high. So that you are motivated to learn because it is your creation. It is your own entity so that you have a vested interest in making that it is good. And lastly, because of the involvement of students, the instructor, and other people they have engaged in, it will as a collaborative approach. They are the co-creators of this knowledge uh, in related to technical extension services. I leave it to Carson. Carson was one of the students in the class, and he can give all the details about the good and bad and the ugly about the class. And so, Carson. No, I'm just good. Good. Yes, I was one of the guinea pigs for uh, Dr. Rodgers' class, and so signed up for it. Uh, this was actually uh, a class from fall of last year uh, where we had some final presentations that went so well that Dr. Rodgerson decided to make a whole other class in the springtime for it. So uh, it was kind of cool to do this project in the fall and take it and expand it out to uh, from just like a little 20 minute presentation to an entire class period with a facilitated discussion. So uh, these are the countries that were chosen by the students in the class. Uh, there was a couple guest lecturers from a couple different places. Uh, but otherwise, pretty much everybody was a student in the class or a student at the university that made a guest appearance for the day. So as you can see, got a nice dispersion throughout the world. Um, and there really wasn't any sort of guidance in terms of, yeah, you got to do a country here, you got to do a country here. Very organically, everybody chose to spread out and take a different country. Um, and some people, and I'll walk through that a little bit, some people chose a country based on some place that they had visited at one point. Uh, some people chose a country because they thought the pictures were cool. And so I'll talk a little bit about how uh, what's kind of neat is like that sort of as an engagement piece for them to dig a little deeper uh, and leverages a lot of that learner center approach that we talked about. Uh, so the major findings, uh, pretty comprehensive list, but it's as you can imagine. Uh, there's a lot of variants and a lot of different systems that started either before or after the 1960s. Uh, you can see a, a very tangible difference in those systems. Uh, a big one that there's a move towards more pluralistic systems doesn't necessarily look like the U.S. A lot of the countries that we reviewed around the world actually look very different than the U.S. system, uh, but they're, they really have diversified their services in you know, the last 50, 60 years. Uh, and again, there's a decentralization of extension services. Uh, and so what you find in a lot of these countries is that they're starting to move a lot of their services out to individual small areas uh, instead of being all centered in the government uh, because things are pretty slow. Uh, Dr. Rikersha, did a very good job of setting us up for that semester to expect that a lot of these countries we would review would have some bureaucratic issues and things would move slow. Um, and so we would find that, that we'd have a lot of these services move out to the local level to speed up a lot of the services they could provide to from farmers all the way to the typical people in the community. Uh, so I'm gonna take you on a very quick plane ride throughout the world of four different countries and give you one big thing to highlight from each of these. Uh, not necessarily like we're giving a presentation today on each one of these countries, but just 
give you a little bit of context of what the students felt uh, as they went through this process of coming up with these presentations. So, uh, Egypt, Brazil, South Africa, New Zealand. We can pull out a couple things from these countries, and I'll take you on a tour of that right now. So, uh, this is the spotlight for Egypt. And so, Caroline uh, did this. She basically saw a picture of the Great Pyramids and thought it was cool, and then did a report on that country. So, uh, what we found from here was there is a huge disparity between people that work in extension in Egypt that have upper level degrees and then people that just get hired in or just have a little bit of college training. Uh, and so we thought this was pretty interesting to compare and contrast to the US where most of all uh, the extension employees have a master's degree. Um, in Egypt, not quite that way. Most everybody has um, just a basic level degree. Um, and then there was a handful, comparatively, uh, of people with PhDs and, and nearly no data for people with master's degrees. So, uh, that was very interesting, and Carolyn brought that out, and that's facilitated discussion on, all right, in the U.S., do we require too much education for our extension agents, uh, or, you know, is that the proper way to do it? So it's kind of a cool discussion that happened after that. Uh, Brazil, uh, Tyler did Brazil, and he actually uh, does his research and did his thesis uh, on soybean production in Brazil and pathogens that impact soybean crop. Uh, and so he had a very personal connection to this, but what he thought was kind of cool was, um, until he took extension classes back at Penn State, he really didn't have that lens and scope for viewing back towards Brazil. Their extension system, he didn't really work with any extension agents down there. Um, so it's kind of neat that he said he could reconnect with some of his contacts down there that he had done uh, when he collected this data. Um, and he could ask them about their extension services and get a kind of a cool different lens for it. So uh, what we found is that the Brazil system actually looks fairly similar to the U.S. Uh, there's just a little bit of a tweak with the funding structure. Um, and so you'll see that funding comes from different areas as opposed to the university driven system in the US. Uh, South Africa, uh, we had a, a student in that class that uh, identified a very hard time finding sources for South Africa. And actually, Carolee uh, with Egypt had the same problem. Um, in the US, there's so many papers written, so many journals about our extension system. A lot of other countries in the world don't have that same luxury. Uh, and so we found that similar with South Africa. It was hard to find information. Uh, but one of the things I want to point out is the disparity, again, in, you know, this time instead of degrees, it's how many, how many farmers have to be serviced by one agent. Uh, and so as you can see, the, the system is not very big. Um, so it's kind of hard. That what she found in the literature was that most of the problems exist with just <coughs> to serve their communities. Uh, I actually highlighted New Zealand in my presentation. Um, and something that I thought was pretty cool was the Crown Research Institutes. Um, so that would be the one big thing that I took away from that was that uh, they don't have the university driven systems, they have these crown research systems, um, and I think that's a whole world where obviously from colonial times, but uh, what's kind of neat is they have these research institutes that then serve the public with their, a lot of the information they're putting out is disseminated very quickly, um, so it's kind of neat that the information is a lot that gets out to the public very easily from these places. I'll turn it back over to Dr. Robert Christian in a very soon. Um, what did we learn from this whole effort of these students who totally immersed into uh, learning this whole concept of uh, energy extension services. Uh, again, as I quickly go through it, that history and the influence of colonial rule is still prevalent in most of the countries that were ruled by British and French. And the social, economic, cultural profile dominate the agricultural scene. And the diversity of uh, agricultural programs and services ranging from huge variety, similar to the uh, US, and still it is a top-down approach not the bottom up or the grassroots. Uh, it is uh, some of the needs of the country we met. Uh, and, so, and as Carson mentioned, we see quite a bit of emergence of pluralistic extension, a combination of private and public sector working together to address the critical needs of uh, the farmers. And this is the one thing that has really improved because of one, one thing without that we cannot function, that is your cell phone. Even farmers, they may not have the education, but they have the cell phone and access information and all those. Very critical. And linkage between extension and research is still weak in most of the countries, which is weak here also in the United States. The extension folks and research folks don't talk to each other much. One thing Constant mentioned about Egypt, education level <coughs> of extension workers is so weak, uh, village level, uh, village level workers has very low qualifications. In Egypt, for the entire country of Egypt, there were seven extension specialist PhD. You can imagine the entire country of 
communicate to yourself and the ego. And needless to say, hampering the extension is the bureaucracy. And moving on, it is one of the outcomes is the complete involvement of the student. That's the best thing that happened to me is to engage them in this whole concept. And learning center participation, they were from day one to the day end, and student agency through decision making. And one of the things is co-creators of the teaching learning enterprise and reflection. And the good outcome is this is a component for an intact 100 course curriculum. We never expected this to happen. It happened that it is included in 100, the very first course they take. And lastly, there is an opportunity for a book chapter that has been accepted out of this. And again, what are the next steps we are going to expand? And then we want to specifically narrow down to certain topics, program evaluation or subject matter, and then do some more of an LCT, and then also look into collaborative efforts between US institutions and other universities for possible uh, work with those uh, countries and see how best we can do. Thank you. And then, just in case you guys get to roll through all the recommendations, we'll leave that out there in the question time. So, I know you've taught a lot over the you know, many years that you've been faculty. So, can you talk a little bit about the difference in teaching a student centered course as opposed to maybe a more instructor or oriented course? I could easily say that Dr. Haynes is that when I kept the student uh, learner course, it was left to them. Only thing I have to scratch my head a little bit to provide them the guidance, not create. You can see the amount of effort and time they have put in to create this whole thing and the presentation, uh, writing 15 to 20 page paper. And imagine if I were to be the instructor led, I have to create all these, organize all these. But I gave it to them. Of course, I was there to help them guide through all the time. It is there, that's why I say it, it is uh, why we say co-creators of this knowledge. That's the huge difference I see between my uh, role as an instructor as opposed to these are all as uh, not only producers of the knowledge, of the creators of knowledge, but also it is. And one of the things it was that time was not enough to discuss. It was so rich. But I have to end the class, and again, this happened during COVID. Everything has to be cleaned, wiped out, and masked, and all of those. And so that's a one main difference. For a simplistic way, I could easily say I got lazy, so I just uh, give it to them. <laughs> so <laughs> I'll add too that uh, not only do we have the we have the summative assessment at the end of that final paper, and obviously our presentations, but we also had to do uh, a couple of reflective pieces, and so. Um, if a presentation particularly moved us, then that could be one of our two or three uh, reflection items. And so we had to write a couple page paper, just uh, not necessarily on doing any more digging for content, but just how we felt about what we saw in their presentation and during that facilitated discussion. So it's kind of cool. I didn't even have to look up anything for these countries. I actually remember a lot of that stuff based on the reflection that we did during the course. So I think that yeah. was very beneficial. I, I forgot each student, in addition to final paper from the countries they chose, they also have write two-page reaction paper based on listening to other students. So that was the even more energy. All right. Other questions? First of all, it's nice to see T Nelson T pulling it out. <laughs> Second of all, I have a question for, uh, for you all. In, in the presentations, was there a linkage between the extension professionals internationally and Peace Corps? Were there any linkages between those two? Did they work together, collaborate? Dr. Haynes, we did see some mention of that. Again, we did not really much uh, go into the detail. Uh, it is just, uh, again, each uh, student wrote about 15, 20 pages long. And uh, it was a little challenge uh, to synthesize everything. And we came up with this six or seven uh, bullet points. Yes, there is some uh, connections between those. Uh, but uh, more needs to be examined, as I say, in, uh, in the second uh, box here, is that this gave you a overall picture of a country 
But one thing I say, because since I'm in the program development and evaluation, all the reviews indicated very little or no emphasis on evaluation. So, except in case of New Zealand, Australia, and to some extent in Philippines and all, but other countries, no monitoring, no evaluation at all. And if you go ahead and ask uh, Brian, based on my experience, they say, first of all, we do not have resources to do the simple program. How in the world do you expect me to? Uh, accountability is totally lacking. In, again, I'm not blaming them, but that's the way the, the situation are. So that's a good way to look at it. Yes. For one more. Yes, uh, we are uh, exploring that. Uh, this is the first step we want to. And one of the reviewer comments was, uh, is this a LCT focused or is it an extension focused? So I said that in my presentation, as I said, we killed two words in one shot. Uh, so that's both. But we need to tighten up a little bit on the methodologies to really make it into a, this is more, I would easily say, Brian, uh, more of exploratory, but in evaluation, you know very well, unintended outcomes much more, uh, way more than the intended outcomes. So, the comments on SRDs at the end of the semester were very positive, the ratings were very high. And so, that's the reason he suggested uh, this is a one credit class, make it into three credits. And uh, major contribution is this is. A big contribution to our intact geotechnical program curriculum. 